the epistle for this uh, solemnity of the ascension of our Lord is from the book of Acts. In the former book, O Theophilus, I spoke of all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day on which he was taken up, after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them also he showed himself alive after his passion by many proofs, during forty days appearing to them and speaking of the kingdom of God. While eating with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, of which you have heard, said he, by my mouth. For John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. They, therefore, who had come together began to ask him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the very ends of the earth. And when he had said this, he was lifted up before their eyes, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing up to heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white garments and said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up to heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven shall come in the same way as you have seen him going up to heaven. Continuation of the Holy Gospel <clears throat> according, to, <clears throat> according to St. Mark. At that time, <clears throat> excuse me, at that time Jesus appeared to the eleven disciples as they were at table, and he upbraided them for the lack of faith and hardness of heart, in that they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. And these signs shall attend those who believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall get well. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. But they went forth and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the preaching by the signs that followed. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, not having any specified uh, intention, I will make it for the intentions of this traditional Latin community, including uh, all those who are sick in our community, and uh, all those who have uh, relatives that are in the hospital or uh, other ailments or difficulties right now. Brothers and sisters, the, uh, is this too loud, by the way? There's too, you can't hear it. It's good? Okay. To me, it sounds like it's blowing my ears out. Um, the Lord, the Lord is the name, the Old Testament name for God. And St. Mark says that he ascends to the right hand of the Father. So Jesus has proved his divinity by his resurrection. He now fulfills his prophecy to the Sanhedrin. I paraphrase, you shall see the Son of Man at the right hand of the Holy. St. John Chrysostom says about the Ascension, through the mystery of the Ascension, we who seemed unworthy of God's earth are taken up into heaven. Our very nature, against which cherubim 
guarded the gates of paradise is enthroned today high above all cherubim. What an uh, interesting way to look at these things. Cherubim, of course, are the second order of all the angels, and uh, so they are really powerful creatures. And uh, we have our human nature now sits enthroned even above them. Jesus ascended to be glorified in his humanity, as we heard last week, and to open heaven for the faithful. Now he mentions all these miracles and uh, special charisms that would be given uh, by the Holy Spirit. And it, it, the way the text reads, it's clear that it's not only the apostles, but also other devout or holy Christians that would be able to exercise these things according to God's will, not theirs. I know some folks who think they get the, the um, flow of the Holy Spirit, they can turn it on and off like a faucet, uh, but that's not the way the Spirit works. He blows where he will. He blows according to what are the needs of God's kingdom at the time. Uh, so the uh, St. Gregory the Great responded when people said, why don't we, by his time even, why don't we uh, have the, all these miracles happening all over the place now? And he said, it's very simple. It was needed to get evangelization going as the church was uh, starting to grow. But it is not so much needed now. It's in our hands, in other words, for the most part. Now, a miracle we need to understand is a change in the natural order of causation uh, that is worked through God's power for his purposes. And that is, in this case, there would be signs of his presence, his goodness, and his power for those who perhaps uh, whose faith is not all that strong or who are new to the faith. There's no uh, cult of St. Philomena. Many of you might know her relics were discovered in, uh, in a tomb uh, in, a, in a cemetery in the Rome area uh, around 1805, I think it was. And uh, they didn't know, you know anything about this person. And uh, they kind of... Uh, uh, the Pope at the time just said, well, okay, we'll send the relics over to this church in a different part of Italy and uh, they can uh, you know, have some relics. It's a genuine relics of a Christian martyr. And as soon as the saints' relics were, were uh, uh, put in that other church, the place exploded with miracles, miraculous healings and all other kinds of things. The lame became, were able to walk again. And the miracles still happen. Miracles still happen today through Christ's church. Uh, for instance, transubstantiation at every mass. That's a change by God worked in the natural order of causation. He makes that change from the uh, uh, the usual way thing, material things change is that the, uh, the qualities that they have change, but the, what it is that has them, as long as it hasn't been destroyed, uh, still exists. Uh, you can uh, think, for instance, of photographs of ourselves from infancy, if they have, if they have survived the. Uh, the woes of time, uh, and right up to the present. A lot of changes in us, but it's still the same person in each case. So uh, this miracle of transubstantiation reverses that in the case of the bread and the wine. So that the, uh, the, bread, the qualities of the bread and wine remain but what it is or who it is that has them changes. That is the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Also, of course, there are special Eucharistic miracles uh, that uh, there are many shrines to in Europe and some in North America and probably elsewhere in the world. 
uh, healings while having recourse to particular saints in prayer. And uh, this goes on more than just the ones that we hear about. I remember Father Hardin said in a class one time, he said he went to somebody and they were hopelessly ill in the hospital and he put a miraculous medal on them. And by the next day, whatever it was that was their ailment was gone. And the doctors were scratching their heads, you know. Doctors don't like to scratch their heads, but uh, there wasn't any natural explanation. Exorcisms, uh, various and sundry other things. Now I pulled out Father Goffin's The Church's Year. That's a book from the 1800s. It's reprinted by the uh, Angelus Press. And uh, I wanted to read um, some of these sayings. It's under the question, are miracles wrought now in the Catholic Church? And he says, of course there are. And they mentioned uh, St. Francis Xavier who raised several dead persons to life in the sight of the uh, heathens, that is the people who were not uh, converted yet. And he says, in a spiritual manner, all pious Catholics still work such miracles. For as uh, St. Chrysostom said, they expel devils when they banish sin, which is worse than the devil. They speak new tongues when they converse no longer on vain and sinful things, but on those which are spiritual and heavenly. They take up serpents, says St. Gregory the Great, when by zealous exhortations they lift others from the shame of vice without being themselves poisoned. They drink deadly things without being hurt by them. When they hear improper conversation without being corrupted or led to evil, they lay their hands upon the sick and heal them. When they teach the ignorant, strengthen by their good example those who are wavering in virtue. Keep the sinner from evil and similar things. And Goffin goes on to say, Strive to do this upon all occasions, O Christian, for God willingly gives you his grace. You will thus be of more use to yourself and others and honor God more than by working the greatest miracles. Father Gabriel, looking at what this means for our behavior, has got this to say, as in Christ crucified we die to sin, as in the risen Christ we rise to the life of grace, so too we are raised up to heaven in the ascension of Christ. This vital participation in Christ's mysteries is the essential consequence of our incorporation in him, referring to the incorporation through baptism. He is our head, we as his members are totally dependent upon him and intimately bound to his destiny. So basically what it means for our behavior, we have to act like it. We have to act like what I just read. The apostles, as we see in the gospel, didn't get off to the best start. Mary Magdalene had come and told them that Jesus had risen. They didn't believe her. And the guys from Emmaus came back and told them that Jesus had risen. They didn't believe them. And uh, so Jesus, when he does appear to them, reproaches them for their disbelief. But you notice he doesn't take away their commission, their job, to go out and spread the gospel to the whole world and to baptize those who respond to spread the good news of his triumph all over the world. The point is not the apostle's power. The point is Christ's power. God uses our very weaknesses or our unwillingness to achieve his purposes, to show his goodness and power, not ours. Thank goodness for that, because let's face it, we all have a lot of weaknesses that we personally could think of and uh, to think that the Lord will somehow work through any of those that he needs is a wonderful consolation. 
In every Mass, we should recognize our opportunity to walk again in His steps uh, to, um, through the... Uh, hmm. Can't read what I wrote here. Okay, well, uh, through His... Uh, okay, through His ministry, we walk through that with the readings and maybe a little bit with a sermon. <laughs> through his passion, death, that is the sacrifice of the mass, and through his resurrection, the glorification of Christ, which is what we receive in Holy Communion. The ascension should mean our, our ascension above the evils of this world through which we show his goodness through our humble lives. So when we come to Mass, we are sent out likewise to go and do the same thing in our lives more than in words to proclaim the gospel to every nation. May God bless you. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.